Uh, so yeah, when you talk about the open source project called LakeFS, uh, it's similar to Git, but it's for data lakes. Uh, it's built for data lakes purpose. So, but before I go into more detail on the hard side, I would like to tell some story like 25 years back, I was here on the East Coast in US East Coast working for a tier one telecom company. I was part of the international division of that telecom company. So we used to get data files from all over the world. Like we had operations in about 30 countries. And you can guess which com company it is. The challenge was when we used to get all those data files, we had a lot of calculations we run at night, like thousands of calculations, mainly doing the currency translation, doing all the US GAAP. If you're familiar with the accounting practices, US GAAP practice, we had to convert. So we used to do a lot of calculations at night. And the, but the problem was like if the files changes or something in the calculations in the in the change, it was very really hard to debug the problem. So let's say if uh, some country sent a new file, and we see the next day finance people see a new number, they reach out to us like why it changed, how it happened, what what happened. So it was very really hard to debug that kind of problem. So we had we were using a Git a kind of a version control software at the time, like 25 years back, it was a product called Harvest from Computer Associates, if you somebody might know here. So we were, yeah, we were using uh, the Harvest for version control of the code, the, all the calculations we were doing, but we were not able to version control our data files. So once we get the new files, calculations numbers change, and then finance guys are screaming, why? because they have to do the closing. So it take, it used to take us about 15 days to kind of close the financial books. So that was a pain. So so when I interviewed with this company about four months back, I joined this company, I was telling the CEO, and I wish I we had this product for version controlling the data lakes or data files like 25 years back. So that's got me excited. That's why I joined this company. So when I joined my CTO, told me a real story how this company got started. And it's a very embarrassing story for him. <laughs> so he used to work, he and our two co-founders, like CEO and CTO, they used to work for a company called Similar Web. It's a marketing research company. They collect data about all the digital interactions you have with your customers, your partners, and vendors. So they collect all the digital interactions you have. So they collect huge volume of data. So our CTO was in the engineering team there. So they had a program which, like our daily, at night they used to run a program to clean some data. And nobody like wanted to touch that program. People used to hate that because it used to clean up the data. They don't want to mess up anything with the program. It was running very slow. So our CTO, he got, he thought, okay, let me fix this. There are a lot of edge cases. He needs to fix those. So, okay, he said, okay, let me look into that program and fix it and make it faster also. So what he did, like he had a staging area where he tested his new code, new program to make sure that things work, but his staging area was very small data set. But when he moved that in into production and ran that program in production, it deleted like about a petabyte of data, which was not supposed to delete. <laughs> But he divided about like 750 million objects in S3, in their S3 data lake, and a pad of white. So how it was on the file, everybody was screaming, what happened? They were, I think they were running airflow at the time. So when it got turned red, people started screaming, what happened? But one good thing happened after that, they got the CEO's attention at the time. Like, so they need to fix that problem. So they tried a couple of things internally to fix the problem in the similar web. But that's where my, our two co-founders got the idea to kind of build this product, to make it like a Git kind of product for data lakes, where you can do the version controlling. So if he had that product at the time, he could basically branch from production and now exit and replica of the production data in the staging environment where he can do all the testing and test, make sure if, if it deletes the any data, let's say if he merges that and the, all the changes into production. If if we had a product like this, he could easily revert back the change. So at the time, they tried to kind of 
uh, recover from the losses, but it was very hard. Because some, think about 750 million objects got deleted. They had the version control, uh, like object version enabled in the S3, but it's still to recover those many objects, it was a pain. So, so that's where this company got started. Just quick introduction, I'm a solutions architect, Amit Kesavani, as Eric mentioned earlier. So you can reach out to me on uh, on my Twitter account or, or GitHub. And the company uh, is, name is Treeworth. The open source project name is LakeFS, but the company name is Treeworth. So that's our get for cost, we both. And this is our mascot. It's uh, here we call it Lottie. And Lottie is actually a creature animal. Uh, it's found in the in the lakes, and and it cleans it cleans the data lakes. So and it keeps the data lake clean, all lakes clean. So that's where we got this mass card, uh, so that our Lottie can keep all these data lakes nice and tidy and clean. So let's talk about like how this company initially when they start building this product, they tried different options to make it perfect. So initially they thought, why not just use Git? Like Git is used for the open, so or, or the coding. So why not use the Git for data lakes also? So that's the first kind of attempt they tried because if if they can do similarly in the data lake, like branch, create a branch from the production data, rip, replicate everything, not replicate, maybe have a mimic of your production copy of the data, and then run all your tests, run your ETL job, whatever you want to do the testing, you want to change your calculation, test those, <clears throat> and when you are satisfied, you basically merge into production. So that's how this, the Lake Affairs got created, the project got created. Like basically it's Git for object stores, whether it's S3 on or Azure Blob Storage, or uh, Google Storage, Google Cloud Storage, or any on-prem storage which has S3 compatible uh, APIs. So if it is S3 compatible API, any storage like, for example, MinIO, or Dell has a Dell ECS, so it works with any of S3 compatible storage. So first thing, we've we looked into our wish list, like what we should have as in the product. So one thing required was the branching, quick and easy to branch the, your data lakes. Think about in, in your production data lakes, if you have terabytes or petabytes of data, you know, lots of object, how can you easily and fast branch, create the branch from your production? And then also do the efficient difference between the production data and the, your different branches. So let's say if you create a new branch where you're testing your code, testing your new TL, now you want to compare with the production, you should be able to do it quickly. And think about these are the large volume of data, number of lots of data files. So it has to be very fast, uh, diff creating the, calculating the difference, and also able to merge into production very quickly and also provide a familiar interface similar to Git. Like, like some people may not agree that Git is very intuitive in terms of commands, but people are used to writing those commands. And like a lot of people, they know like five commands for the Git and they stick to that. They don't want to try different things. You never know what will break. So we thought we'll do something similar as the Git commands where you can branch and all those, create all this stuff that Git provides. So those were kind of our wish list when we started building that product. But it was not easy to like go through this. So the challenge was how do we scale like Git to billions of objects? Git is normally built for human scale. Built for maybe thousand commits, hundred thousand objects, but not built for for huge volume of data, multiple data files. A lot of time in if you're family with Delta Lake, it creates or data tables, it creates lots of parquet files, a small parquet file. So how do you handle kind of millions of objects, not 100,000 or 200,000 objects, like, like what Git can do? So far, so good. So we tried different attempts. So this is the first attempt we tried where let's take Git and put Git on top of the object store, on, on top of S3 in this case. 
and will store the metadata to those objects in Git. So basically, here, here in the metadata, which is in the Git, we are storing just the pointers to these objects which are stored in S3. So that was our first attempt. The challenge here is, as I mentioned earlier, that Git is built for human scale. So what they do internally, they store all these objects in the directory structure. So let's say if you have one folder or one directory in your office store, and you have, let's say, a million files, so it stores all those in a directory structure like this. The challenge with this is, let's say if you change one object or one small file, it has to recreate this directory structure again. So if you have 100 millions of objects, small objects, in your single directory in a data table, let's say, for example, and if you change even one record or one file, it has to recreate this directory structure again. So anytime if you want to kind of create a branch and make a change and try to merge into production, it has to redo all these directory structures. And that's very time consuming. So it's not very fast enough, uh, which we were looking initially. And fast, not fast enough, also merging was also very slow because when you merge, as I mentioned, it has to recreate whole directory structure here. But people are familiar with the Git, so it was familiar kind of commands, everything was same. The only challenge was it was not fast enough to handle the billions of objects. So what we thought, uh, like, what should be our next, uh, what should we try next? So in case of those data objects, what we saw is mostly you are making fast lookups, kind of you're trying to do a lookup of certain objects, small objects, all kind of scanning lots of objects. So what we thought maybe the database might be a good option for that. Instead of storing those math, uh, pointers for, for the objects in Git, why not store it in the database? Because database is good for kind of quick scanning, quick lookup of the objects. So that's where we tried next, is putting all this metadata pointers to object in Postgres, in this case, initially. So instead of using Git, you place that Git with Postgres, where we store these pointers to objects, and the objects are still in S3 on objects to miss this. So we have an example like using the, the SQL to get some objects uh, or metadata from Postgres. So in this case, what we are looking for, let's say if I create a branch from my production uh, production main branch, and then I have some some folder called events where I am storing lots of events, uh, and I want to find all the objects or those events in the events path. And so initially we thought, yeah, this will go pretty well. It will use index and it will be pretty fast lookup. But when we ran this, it, it, it was doing the sequential scan. It was not doing the indexing, and I'll tell you why. So it was doing a sequential scanning, scanning the whole table. So let's think of if the table, in this case, metadata of all the objects, billions of objects, it has to scan the whole table. And then it took about, about a second. Might, it may sign, sound like it's not a big deal, like a second to scan the whole table, but there were only a few objects here, not a, not billions of objects. So it was fine initially for a second, but think about if you are doing lots of branching, lots of uh, changes, and every time it has to take that much time, it will become very slow to that. And let's look into why it was doing the sequential scan, not the indexing. Like that, that's what we initially thought. We are doing the lookup, so it should use index. So what any database, not just Postgres, any database does, it uses the optimizer. Uh, so in this case, for example, using cost-based optimizer. So it looks into, your, analyzes your SQL, and looks into the SQL path, how it is doing, and then it can pick up from multiple different paths or different plans just that it generates. So in this case, for example, let's say two two plaques. One is doing the sequential scan, which is the full table scan. Another is index lookup. That's what we were thinking we, we should get this index, use the index lookup. But what happens here when database 
they select this optimizer or cost-based optimizer plan, they look into the, all the stats about the table. So behind the scene, they generate the stats for the table, like how many records are there in the table, what's the size of different columns are, what's the size of the row. Based on that, that it makes a decision to take a certain path to select the data from the database studies. So in this case, let's say if you have production main branch and you create a new branch for testing purpose, and let's say you are copying all the metadata for production branch, so let's say hundreds of millions or billions of record. So suddenly for that branch in the database, from zero record, it goes up to a billion record in the table. So stats are still not generated. And when you start using that branch, it will, do, it will think that table was initially for that branch, it was only zero record five minutes back. So I'll let me do the full table scan. So what happened in, in last five minutes, we generated a billion record in that table for all those objects, all those metadata, but the stats did not catch up. So it was always doing the sequential scan. Make sense so far? So that, that was about like a challenge with the, using the app Postgres database. So what we tried is, we also tried to look into like tuning or kind of changing the query SQL so we can trick the database to use index instead of using the full table scan. But just to trick, we had to like write a bunch, a lot of, lot of code and for the hard to manage, maintain the SQL for, with that. So, First of all, it, again, the problem we faced, it was not very fast enough because it was doing the sequential scan instead of the indexing. And so that made the diff, default uh, merging very uh, slow. And also it was unpredictable behavior with database. Like sometimes it will do a sequential scan, sometimes, uh, like let's say, meanwhile it generated the stats, now it will start doing the index lookup. So it's very unpredictable behavior we saw. And the code became very cumbersome because we were trying to trick Postgres or database. So we added some of the hints. So some of the things we use in the database to trick the system, then code becomes very cumbersome to maintain and manage. So next we thought we tried a different approach. So in this case, what we saw that Let's, why not we just keep all these metadata pointers in a separate bucket in S3 or in object store. So we have all the objects here and also the metadata is also stored in, in the S3 or in the storage. Only in Postgres we are maintaining the branch names. So at main branch or testing branch, whatever branches or reference you create, that we store in the in Postgres, but rest of the all the pointers and everything are, for the objects are stored in S3. So we kind of create this kind of hierarchy. This looks intimidating, but I'll go one by one step. So don't try to read everything. I'll go step by step. So, so on the at the lowest level, we have this all these data files. It can be structured or unstructured data. Uh, it can be parquet file or your images or videos, whatever you have, it's stored in your object store. So on top of that, we create the ranges. So if you saw the problem with the Git initially, we saw like Git has a directory structure and if you have a billion record or billion objects, it puts in everything into one directory, one structure. So what we did, we divided that into two multiple ranges so that we can easily manage those. And if if anything change, we change only a range. Let's say if, if one file change in a particular range, we only change that range. So so here, like we have that key value pair stories. Here we keys are the basically uh, file names and the values are location, where is this file stored on S3, what's the size. So all the metadata about that particular object is is stored as a value here in this range, and it's alphabetically sorted. So the reason we sorted this because 
initially we looked at, we decided to use database because we wanted to use indexes. So that's basically is our index. It's a sorted list of all the objects and with the location metadata information. And organized in the range, in this case, for example, the object A to F are stored in, in this range, and G to, uh, G to J is stored in this range, and so on to, to Z. And what we decided, like all these range, when we divide, we create a size of about 1 MB to 8 MB. So if you're familiar with the database concept, in database you have page size, where when you are looking at something, you pull that page. So it, normally the page should be small enough that you can quickly grab and select and bring into memory. So that's why we decided let's keep the this size of these ranges or the page size for this range to about 1 to 8 MB in size. And also these are immutable. So let's say in when you create a commit or when you create a branch, once you commit, these things are not going to change. So it's immutable. So basically we sorted, stored it in on, on S3 in the alphabetical order in different ranges, divided by A to, in a, A to Z. And then on top of that, we have meta range. So, so on top of ranges, we have, so now at the bottom level, you have the, the uh, data files, and then you have ranges. On top of that is meta range. And meta range is basically pointing to multiple ranges here. So um, a meta range is basically a pointer to also a commit. So when you commit, a commit is pointing to a meta range and meta range has lots of ranges here. So let's say if you if you create a, another branch and in that branch, when you commit, you are just changing one file, let's say one or two files, starting with, in this case, M. So this will impact, affect only the range where files of M are stored. So in this case, this range from K to Q will be only changed. Rest of the ranges remain the same. So when you basically made a copy or branch from this, let's say a previous commit, the only range it changes is this one. Rest of the ranges remain the same. Make sense so far? So now, let's say if we have to do a difference between those two branches, then it becomes much easier because what we have to do is we have to only look for the ranges with change. All the ranges that we, which did not change, we don't even have to worry about looking into those range. So because we are maintaining the pointers, which ranges change, so we just take those and do a diff. Basically, it's a set kind of operation. Here you have intersection, Anything which is outside the intersection is basically a difference. And then we look into those ranges and tell you which objects of which file change from branch A to branch B. And so in that case, difference, calculating a difference is not the, dependent on the size of your data lake, not dependent on the billions of objects in your data lake, but only the objects with change. So let's say if you change about 100 thousand or hundred net objects in your data lake. So the to find the difference is different dependent on the number of objects which change each of the all the objects. So that makes it very fast to do the difference, calculate the difference. And also when we have to merge, we have to merge only those objects which change, not everything. So so we it made a lot of improvements, so it got a little faster. We, we saw that the merging and the difference was creating the diff was efficient, but it was not fast enough. The reason big is what we saw is when we start testing all this, that on S3 or any object store, object stores are built for maximum high throughput, not for low latency. What we were looking for low latency because we are trying to find the object very quickly, but so on like 50% of time, like P50, Everything worked fine, but if we start looking P90 or P99, the latency was too high. For, so it, we still did not get very, very fast performance we were looking for. Even the rest of the requirements wish list was fulfilled, but it's still not fast enough. So normally what we have seen in the database world, like 
like when you are pulling the data from the pages or from the disk to improve the performance, you start doing the caching. So, so in, in case of caching, uh, so you store those objects like up front in, in the, on the disk or, or in, in the RAM. So what we do in this case here is like, let's say if you're working on the branch, so all the metadata, all the objects in that branch, you put in the cache. So it, it goes most frequently used goes in on the disk, and then and the recent one recently used data goes into the RAM. So the challenge with the caching is, if some of you might know, is uh, how to invalidate the cache. Like if the things change, you have to kind of regenerate the cache. So there are. There's quote that there's two hard things in the computer science like cache invalidation and the naming things. So with the naming things, like we named our project Lake FS, so we were already failed that. And so the problem was like how do we handle this cache invalidation? But we were lucky enough, uh, like in our case, we did not have to worry about caching. The reason being is because it's immute our our commits are immutable. Nobody's changing the commits. Once you commit something, you can't change that. So in this case, our pages or objects or metadata is not changing within a branch. Like when you merge to the bra a different branch or when you merge to the main branch, yes, those objects are changing. But once you make a commit, once you commit something, it's immutable. So that's where we had an advantage of serving. I went too fast. So. So these are like immutable pages or is data stored, metal data stored on S3. So once we bring into our cache, we don't have to invalidate. As long as it is used, frequently used, it will stay in the cache. If it is not, then it will get removed from the cache. So that's for our like three and a half or third, third of the attempt to improve the performance. So now we got all our wish list and kind of completed. Like we got the quick branching using uh, utilizing the database where you can in the database you can create the quick a new record for a branch. We got fast in for uh, performance because of the caching reason. And for efficient diffing or merging, we use the set kind of operation I explained earlier where we look for only the ranges that change not the whole directory structure. And then also we use the same kind of command structure as the git. People who are familiar with the git, they create the branch and commit the branch. The same structure or same command kind of made take. So now, before I go into a demo, I want to give a live demo. Uh, any questions so far? So how do we so the ranges seems like it's a key, is it? Foundry is in the key space. How are the ranges determined? Are they determined by a human or are they determined like by a split R rather than like edge base users? So it's, and, and, and the, the follow-up question is, do, do those, do those boundaries, how frequently do those boundaries change? Okay. I mean, can you repeat the question for the record? Yeah. The question is like, uh, all these ranges, how how do you calculate the range first and how frequently those ranges change? So let me go back here. So for the one calculation I mentioned earlier, it's the range size is about one to eight MB. So depending off of your number of objects, let's say you have 100 million objects and each metadata takes a couple of bytes, let's say. So based on that, we'll say, okay, it's a hundred million objects. So have one meg page size, I need to put maybe a 10,000 metadata objects or metadata for those objects in one file, in one range. So that's how program automatically calculates that internally. And what, again, this is, once you create uh, this uh, branch, only things which are changing, the range is changing in when you add new objects. Yes, when you add, let's say, if you update lots of objects, then it's fine. But if you add many objects, it, it will recalculate these these ranges so that you don't have a skew. So system internally handles that. Any other question? 
in a second. It seems to you implemented your own index. Um, I decided to put it in the index from the Ruby on S3. Why not put on the index you built in the token of the database? So the challenge with the database, again, let's say if I put this matcha data, sorry, into, into my database, we had the same challenge and we saw earlier, it was doing the full table scan sometime, sometime doing the indexing, so if I'm trying to find, while if I store in the S3 objects, as objects in S3, we can just pick the range that we need. So just get the one page size that we need instead of doing the full scan of the table. So in that case, let's say, if you have, let's say 10,000 ranges that have, and I'm interested or I'm changing only one object in range 10. So I need to just pick that range and bring it to memory. While if I go into database, if it does pull a table scan, it will take forever. But sure, it could be your point and you put it better way. So initially we tried to trick the system, like as I mentioned earlier, we tried to trick the system so that we can have something similar like then like this in the database, but it became very cumbersome to manage. Like your data model became very cumbersome, your SQL became very cumbersome. So we thought to simplify the things, this might be a better approach where we are dividing number of objects into smaller chunks, which is easier to manage. And internally, if you think about database is doing the same thing. They are storing those into pa different pages. When they pull it, uh, so it goes to a certain page and pulls that information if you are doing the lookup. But here we are controlling ourselves. Instead of database controlling, we are managing, controlling it, all these ranges, which range to pick. That makes it much easier for us to control. So what is the size of the metadata relative to the data itself? And kind of how much metadata is your system meant to handle? So metadata is very small. It's just the name on the file and location where it is stored on on S3, as well as size, and there's some other. Such entry is small, but how big is the, the full or not? It depends on the op number of objects you have. So if it is, let's say if you have one file, which is a one terabyte, then you have only one one record here. But if you have 100,000 files, very small files, and if your database size is still, or object store size is still one terabyte, then you have a lot more in the metadata. So it depends on the number of objects. So how many objects is your system built to handle in general? So, so far in our testing, we have tested with about a billion objects. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go to the fun stuff, the demo. Just quick explain what I'm going to show in the demo. So we are going to use uh, this common crawl data set. It's an open source, like freely available data set where it crawls the web and it has all the URL host information, the domain information. So that's data set we are, I'm going to use for this, for this demo. And then there's another data set from Kegel with Kedub is the phishing sites. So basically the first data site is all the sites, it crawls the web, and then we have phishing sites. So what we are doing, going to do is delete those phishing sites from the common crawl database, data set. So it's basically, these are millions of objects, records, and then delete all the phishing sites. That's in, it's in my demo. Basically cleaning up those, uh, the, those, uh, uh, those common crawl data set. Last eight minutes, by the way. Okay. That's you. Let's do quickly. So for this, I'm going to use a notebook. As I mentioned earlier, I'm using the common crawl data, data set. This is about 9,000 parquet files, not that many. To keep it simple. It's about 44 gig of data set. So to try LakeFS on your own, you can go to lakefs.io and try without installing. It will provide an instance in our cloud. So you don't have to install on your own. So you can just sign up for this playground or doing quick testing. 
Uh, and also, we also provide an object store, so you don't have to worry about any object store, S3, anything. We provide S3 as well as the playground, everything there. But this is just for functional testing. But if you want to test with your own object store, with your own S3 or blob storage, uh, you can sign up for the cloud, like FS Cloud. So, so this is how, uh, let me, this is the UI. Uh, when you sign up into LakeFS, there are lots of repositories. I have it here. Uh, so I'm going to, for this, I'm going to use a, create a new repo, new repository. You can do for that, create the new repository from the UI. Or you can do from this, um, going to use Python. We provide the clients for Spark, Python, and many different languages, Java, C. So you can use any of those clients. So here, these are the LakeFS credentials, access key and secret key to connect to or to log into this LakeFS. And the endpoint, so let's run this. And then also set up the Lake Python client here. So this is all just set up. Now I'm going to create the repository from, from here itself. So in this case, if I go back and refresh this, so I got this repository here. Right now, this repo is empty. So I'm going to import uh, object from S3 bucket. So for this, we have I'm using this S3 bucket. Import my neural lake. So when we are importing, we are just importing the metadata about the object. We are not copying the objects. So objects still stored in S3. We are just putting the metadata so that's why it took so it was so fast like like 15,000 objects to scan and then now you can compare uh, and see what or what are those different objects are so in this case let's do a quick check so like in the common crawl database it's about 9,000 objects it's about 44 gig so we just imported about a half terabyte of of data lake into in like in LakeFS. So once everything looks good, I'm going to merge this, all these objects into my main branch. So if I go to my main, I have all these objects here, including this common crawl database data set. Coming back here, so once I import that object uh, or that data, just reading or scanning that. So in this case, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, all the web crawls, so if it has a URL, host name, I uh, also have a domain name here, and other information about all the crawls. So now we have a, a repo in repository in LakeFS. We got all the data set from imported from our, uh, from our data lake, and we have everything in the main branch, so it's ready. So now let's say if I want to do some testing, I want to take the production data, and test my new ETL pipeline. Or I want to do the cleanup like my, as my CDO is famous for deleting stuff, so I want to delete, delete some data set from here, so I want to clean up, create a cleanup branch. So I've just created the cleanup branch. You can also, if you want, you can create the branches from this UI also from here. So once I create this cleanup branch, it was pretty quick to create the branch. So again, we are not copying, it's a zero copy operation. We are not copying the data. We're just copying the metadata. So we took all the objects which were there in the main branch, in the production branch, and created a separate branch which had, and having all those objects here in the cleanup or the separate branch. Now I'm going to upload this uh, phishing sites, all the domains which have phishing URLs, or phishing domains, and upload that. So in this case, I upload my file from my laptop to the uh, to this repository. So once I have that object ready, let's uh, read this. So again, so we create a, we have a main branch, I create the cleanup branch, which has all the same data. If I look into the cleanup branch, it has the same URL. Then I upload this phishing domains. Now let's look into quickly the phishing domains data set. Sorry, I have to rest only a few minutes left. But I can stay after the after this, so I can go into more details. So these domains, if you see, it doesn't look legit. 
So we are going to kind of delete uh, these phishing uh, URLs from the common crawl data set. Uh, so I just ran this. This will take a few seconds. So what I'm doing here, deleting from my common crawl data set, the old phishing domains. So if you notice here, we are using this pointing to LakeFS. Instead of pointing to S3, you are basically pointing to LakeFS, which is going through LakeFS to S3 in this case. And then you specify the repo name. So in this case, we have uh, that Apache Con repo name and the branch name. So in this case, I've created a new branch, which is a cleanup branch, but you can run this against any branch than in the rain branch. So, and, and then now it's going to delete all those uh, records. So this data set is about 275 million records. So it's going to take some time, but hopefully things go well. Let's see. Uh, I ran once before the demo. So, and the, so all these clusters are up and running, the Spark cluster. So hopefully things will go fast. Uh, let's see. And once this deletion is done, then we can compare those two branches, the main branch and the cleanup branch. So, so far it deleted about 24 million uh, records from the common cloud data set. Now I'm going to compare different branches. So this is just a function to kind of count the number of records in each branch. So I'm import both the tables common crawl so in the main branch to the cleanup branch. I'm going to calculate how many records are there. So here, just comparing those two branches. So right now in my production main branch, I have 275 million, but in my cleanup branch, I have like 253 million because 22 million records are deleted. So, so far you are doing all the testing with, with the production data in a separate branch without an, impacting anything to your production users. And if you are happy, you can commit this chain and th in this, you can also attach some metadata. In this case, I'm attaching this notebook. And if you are satisfied, like cleanup went fine, everything is been fine, then you can merge these changes into production branch. So now if I compare my the main branch and the cleanup branch, both should be the same because now I merged my cleanup branch to my main branch, main production branch. So both have the same number of records. And if you want to revert back the changes, let's say if you merge those deletions, you delete that data in the production branch, but you are not happy, you are not satisfied, something went wrong, you want to revert the changes, what happened with my our CTO, if we could revert very quickly, it would have been fine. So in this case, what we can do is we can look into all the commits in my main branch. And this is the deletion here. So I take this ID, commit ID for the deletion, and revert my changes. It took a second, less than a second to reward all the changes, all the deletions I did. And then we can compare the main and cleanup branch again. So now main branch should be back to the normal, like 275 million. Sorry, I had to rush. Thank you.